Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully, you all see us now to um, empower our resilient women. So, for those of you who don't know what this inaugural Power Hour is, it's a new web series welcoming um, and available to all alumni worldwide. It's focused on culturally relevant topics that pertain to issues of diversity, and viewers will recognize the themes from with which people from all backgrounds trying to navigate a challenging world can relate. So, that being said, we only have an hour, so if you all have any questions, feel free to um, go to the sidebar and ask the question, but we may not have time for all of you questions, so know that if you have any questions that you're dying to hear the answer to and that weren't asked, feel free to um, email diversity at alumni.ucla.edu. And again, we'll remind you at the end of the webinar as well. So starting off, though, um, I also want to remind you that the questions that you post uh, will be public, and the answers will also be public. So just recognize that you may have your account put, on, put online for all to see. So feel free to email us the question if you feel like it's very personal. Or if you want to talk about your own personal experiences and you're afraid to do it live, you can also email diversity at alumni.ucla.edu again. With that being said, I guess we'll talk about the panelists and give introductions. So my name is Savannah Badalich. I am a fourth year at UCLA um, undergraduate, so I'm not an alumni yet, but soon will be. Um, I'm the founder of 7000 Solidarity, a campaign against sexual assault, as well as the Student Wellness Commissioner as part of our Undergraduate Students Association Council. Um, I created the 7000 Solidarity Campaign um, as sort of a response to my own sexual assault by a UCLA student at the beginning of my sophomore year. I didn't report my sexual assault. I didn't really know what my resources were at the time. Um, there's been a lot of changes to that, and a lot of that comes from 7000 Solidarity as well as advocates like Nicole, who's also on the webinar, um, working within UCLA to change the structures and making it easier for students to find their resources. Um, but this campaign is my healing process, so I'm very glad to be here. And next I'll go to Shaw. Hi everyone, my name is Shaw Chowdhury. I graduated from UCLA in 1996. I uh, have a degree in psychology and sociology. Um, I had a very traumatic fourth year experience at UCLA. Um, I was living in an apartment just adjacent to campus and uh, a man broke into our apartment and assaulted a dear friend of mine and I, I attempted to rescue her and in the process um, was pretty brutally assaulted um, and it changed my life, it changed the path of my life but uh, nonetheless uh, I survived, my friend survived and we've persevered so that's why I'm here today. Awesome, thank you. Nicole? Sure. Um, my name is Dr. Nicole Green. I am a psychologist by training. Um, I've always had an interest in women's issues and particularly women of color. Now I currently am the director of CARE at CAPS, which is the sexual violence prevention program at UCLA. It's part of the Counseling Center at Counseling and Psychological Services where I've worked for about 10 years. Um, and I see victims or survivors of sexual assault. I also do a lot to do prevention education. I want to try to stop these from happening before they do because I really don't want to deal with the aftermath. I'd like to have, I'd like to work with people before something happens. But if something does happen, um, I'm here to be a resource and to help a student navigate through so that they can feel supported. Um, and unlike Savannah where she didn't know the resources or Shaw where it was traumatic, I'd like to, um, and we're currently working at UCLA, um, really be a resource for students so that they do, are, are able to persevere and be resilient. Um, I also am an alumni of UCLA and I graduated in 1997. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole and Shaw. Um, so then we'll go off and start the Q&A with our own question. Um, and this one is sort of to kick it off by defining resiliency. So how do you define resilience? I'll start with Shaw. Well, for me, resilience was just not letting that individual that, you know, victimized my friends and I take another day off our lives. I just remember being in the hospital, all wired up and you know I'd been stabbed through the face and neck um, multiple lacerations all over my body and I remember lying there thinking to myself I'm gonna get out of this bed and I am not gonna let this individual take another day off my life 
So for me, resilience is the ability to rise, the ability to rise and persevere regardless of, you know, where you are in your life and, you know, just not being afraid to have the courage to stand up and fight for yourself and your life and your freedoms and your happiness. So that's Thank my you. definition. Yeah. Thank you, Shaw, for sharing. Um, for me, it's very similar, and I think that's uh, that goes with being a survivor, especially of this kind of violence, though um, additional violence as well. Um, resilience, I would say, is persevering and maybe finding your own sort of justice. So for someone who doesn't report, um, that is their that that's a choice that they make. They're not scared. They're not um, weak or anything for not reporting, um, and as well as not telling anyone about it. There are many survivors who will tell no one about their sexual assault, and that's still a decision, and they have the agency to make that decision. Um, so they find justice in their own way, and so for me, um, my justice is just trying to figure out ways in which other people don't have to experience what happened to me, or at the very least, people around them or their peers around them um, know how to talk with them. So resilience is working to prevent this from happening to someone else, as well as working within myself to find my own sort of justice and peace. Hmm. Um, and, and for me, as someone who's worked with survivors, one of the things I think that folks struggle with a lot is how do I recover mm -hmm. and not forget what happened but honor the trauma that happened to me but also honor who I am other than the trauma that I've experienced. So for me, resilience is really the relationship between um, navigating who you are, who you were, and the dynamics in your world, and all the ways that that happens, whether, you know, the fight is to prevent future things from happening, sharing your story, getting help individually, spiritually, psychologically, physically, and all the ways that it manifests. I believe that everybody who's a survivor has the potential to have resilience and I think what I want folks to walk away with is knowing that people can get better and it's not a matter of forgetting what happened or forgiving or moving on it's also a matter of honoring and grieving and accepting um, so it's a very um, it's a very dynamic process it's not the same for everyone and it's not the same across time some folks will go a long time and not remember it every day and then something will trigger a memory and it doesn't mean that there's no resilience it just means that that's a part of who you are and we honor that and allow that to happen and then we continue to move forward so I think resilience looks a lot of different ways for a lot of different people particularly women and one of the things I think is most important about resilience is honoring who you are and where you are in the process and I think that that's really what a lot of resilience is yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Sure. Um, all right. So we've now defined resilience, and so we're going to go to the Q and A. Um, and I'll start off with this question: How does your personal experience with this topic affect your daily life? Anyone want to start? Well, I think for me, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's just a big general sense of overall awareness and appreciation for everything. Um, you know, I'm just aware of my surroundings, my senses, because for a, a few weeks I was stripped of the ability to, to swallow and to, you know, to see clearly and I couldn't mm -hmm. use my hands and so I'm just so appreciative and aware of um, just the basics of life and I'm also just more cognizant of my environment. So that has changed um, dramatically and, in a, and I think in a very good way in many respects. I think I have a lot more appreciation for life and living and a lot more awareness of my surroundings and what's going on. So it's not a bad thing. Awesome. Um, for me, uh, this topic, I think for, for students, especially student activists, I know that this is a national uh, topic. And for those who are watching, I'm sure you've seen on the news that there's been a lot of students from the student who, uh, Emma, who carries around the mattress at Columbia, um, to students at USC or Occidental, even at UCLA, um, who do this kind of work. We're not trained professionals. And so for the activists who, who do this kind of stuff, um, it can affect our daily life because we feel like we, we want to help um, change the world and we don't take time for ourselves and to heal and to um, recognize that there's such thing as secondary trauma. 
So sometimes it can affect our daily lives very significantly and in really dramatic and stressful ways. But I also want to say that once you recognize that you're not a, a, a doctor <laughs> and you're not um, a psychologist and you learn to refer people, um, I think for, for me and for many others who do this kind of work coming from the activist realm, um, we find personal healing and growth and um, acceptance through doing this um, as part of our daily lives. But additionally, um, just going through and watching television shows that might have sexual violence, depending on how they tackle it, it can be a little bit hard. Um, but I'm a huge fan of the new show, um, Unbreakable uh, Kimmy Schmidt, and it actually talks a little bit about um, how she experienced sexual violence for a long period of time, and she, taught, and she has a lot of resilience, I, I see. Um, and the way in which Tina Fey has been addressing it's been great. Um, but it depends. At times, like, like Nicole said, it's very triggering um, and it's very daunting, but at other times it can be healing. And I think honoring those different feelings are very important and also understanding as activists and people who continue to work on this work um, who are not professionals and who just have a personal stake in it that we need to take time for ourselves. Um, I would definitely agree. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I'm a big person into social justice and I do think that sexual violence is its a health issue, it's a um, psychological issue, it's a social justice issue, it's a political issue, it's a social issue. It cuts across so many um, domains that are really important to my life mm -hmm. and I think um, the way that this impacts me on a daily basis is that really mostly from the social justice and diversity realm and something I'm very passionate about making sure that folks feel safe on college campuses it's just not tolerable that folks don't feel safe and um, so on a daily basis I think what really impacts me in my work is really fighting for and ensuring that folks feel like there's enough education and reporting and that we have we we foster a culture of really talking about this instead of silence I mean and make no mistake um, violence against women is a worldwide epidemic mm -hmm. worldwide from childhood to elders if you look at any statistics women are at a lot of high risk uh, from human trafficking all the way through and so there's a lot of work to be done and it can get daunting um, but it also really um, allows us the opportunity to foster an environment where women around the world are moving forward. So I do think that this is a big issue on a lot of levels. That's more macro. Mm -hmm. On a micro level, you know, working with the survivors that I've worked with um, can also be very daunting. But one of the things that I know is that people get better. So I, I think that that really, really reduces a lot of my burnout because I trust the healing process. And so I think that it's really important to trust the healing process so you don't get overwhelmed and burnt out. I do believe people can get better. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so our next question is um, from a woman named Julie. What advice um, would you give your... Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, what advice would yourself of today give the younger you or younger self? Sorry, I'm butchering your question. Um... I, for me, my younger self would say um, it's not your fault because what happened to me was by someone I knew and trusted and was my friend and um, many sexual assaults uh, are by someone you know and you trust. It's not just a stranger. Um, so for me, my sexual assault didn't fit the narrative I had seen in the media and in movies. Um, and I felt like somehow because I knew this person that it was my fault. So the few things I would say was it's not your fault. Um, you're not alone. Um, what you went through was, was something that you couldn't have prevented because there were so many instances because mine involved alcohol and by involved someone I knew. Um, and so there were so many things that I... Um, that we are taught in society that if you just carry around. My dad gave me, for example, uh, when I went off to college, a pink uh, pepper spray and a pink taser, as if that was going to, I was going to have that on me when I was going to hang out with my friends all the time. 
Um, and of course, because I trusted this person, I didn't have that with me, and I wouldn't think to have that with me. So there were so many things I thought after I was um, I experienced my assault, like why didn't I not drink? Why was I so friendly with this person? Why um, didn't I lock the door? Like all these, all these things went through my head. So I think I would, t and and even after it happened, when I tried to talk to some people about it, including my own family, but not using my um, my name, sort of talking about it as if it was a friend. They brought up those questions, so and those questions tend to blame the person for their own assault. So I would tell myself that you're not alone. It's not your fault. There's nothing that you could have done to prevent it. Um, and lastly, you you do have resources, and there are places you can go. Um, just because my my situation, I didn't know where to go. Didn't know who to talk to. And the few people I did talk to. One was very, very supportive, but many others, like my parents, were not. Um, so by the spring of my sophomore year, I got into a depre depressive state and um, tried to take my own life. And that's something that happens with many survivors. Um, and so I don't want people to get to that point. So I would say that you do have resources, and there are free ones, including ones if you're all at UCLA at CAPS. But those are some of the things I would tell myself. Yeah, I I follow suit. I mean, I was not the victim of sexual assault, but definitely a violent crime. And the individual who assaulted myself and, and my friends, um, he actually escaped on foot. So he's still at large. Nobody knows where he is. Uh, so I had to live with that fear for a really long time. And I felt that not only, you know, what, did I feel somewhat responsible because my friends were also assaulted within my apartment, so I felt somewhat responsible that it was my fault and I didn't address it for a while. I also struggled with being really tough. I felt like I had to, you know, act like a warrior and be strong and get to school every day and not complain about the stitches in my face or this man being at large or living under an alias name for a while. Um, so, you know, I, I dealt with all of that, and if I could speak to my younger self, I would have probably taken off some of the armor and gone and sought some help a little bit earlier. So I think if I could talk to the younger Shalini, that's what I would say. Don't carry all that burden, all that weight on your own. It's not your fault. And, you know, if you need some help, if you need to get some sleep at night, go talk to somebody. It's, it's not a crime to do that. It's not bad to need help. Um, so that's what I would say. And I waited a really long time to get it. So um, that delay definitely set me back a little bit. Yeah. And I just would add, you know, um, I haven't been a victim of sexual assault, but I've been part of the victim blaming culture. So I think the younger version of me um, would have more, I mean, what I'm hoping for is that folks have more insight into a lot of this stuff. And um, you know, a lot of the, well, folks have been drinking, or is that really an assault, or, you know, all the stuff that we're all infused with as a result of this rape culture that we live in. And I think, you know, for folks that are younger to really challenge themselves um, to kind of get out of the victim blaming mode. And I think that we all participate in this culture around this about it not being that serious when this happens or that happens or somebody should have known better. And I certainly can remember being in college and thinking this girl should have known better and they should have done this and they could have known that. And so I think for folks who are just allies, it's really important to kind of honor that and recognize who we were as those younger folks so that we don't, oh, well, that's just somebody else. That's all of us. But to really challenge that in ourselves and in each other. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm thinking about how before... Um, what I experienced, I probably said to many people that I knew and many of my friends some of the things that I myself didn't want to and um, really hurt to hear. So I, yeah. I very much vibe with that. Um, okay, our next question is, do you have um, suggestions for how to help a friend or family member who shares a story about being a victim? Is there a way to be anonymous and report it? I almost want to like give this to Nicole okay. <laughs> yes, first. Well, it yeah. depends. If you're on campus, you can anonymously report. But I will say, um, you know, and if, if you're concerned about the community or like that this person is going to hurt somebody else, you may want to take that avenue. And you certainly can contact the Dean of Students Office at UCLA. 
it's hard with anonymous reports because it's hard to follow up on them and if the person is not ready to report you've sort of taken the power out of their hands mm -hmm. and so um, while I recognize the real sheer well they don't want to do anything about it I'll do for them you know and wanting to support someone in that way I would just really um, pause with that and consider what is this person what it, how how best do you want to help your friend and who is this helping because sometimes people want to do something because it makes them feel better and reduces their anxiety um, as the friend because they want to feel like they have something. There's nothing to be done sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes tolerating the fact that your friend's in distress and all you can do is be there for them or hold them or take care of them, that's all there is. And I have a lot of students that come in wanting to support somebody and do something. And really what's to be done is to just be. And um, if there is a concern in the community that you're in that someone's at large and is going to hurt somebody else, certainly I would encourage anonymous reporting so that the police, maybe they already know that person has assaulted three other people and they don't know about the fourth. So certainly I would do my due diligence to make sure the community is safe, but if it's to, I want to help my friend and she doesn't want to do it so I'm going to take the reins, sometimes the most important thing you can do is just be and be still until someone's ready because I think it's very disempowering to someone mm -hmm. to not have that choice. Yeah, I totally agree. If someone had reported my sexual assault without giving me the choice to, I think it would have been more devastating for me. Um, just because they, one, didn't give, when, when you're assaulted, your control is taken away. And the one thing I had control in was how I was going to respond to my sexual assault, and I think that um, if someone had reported it for me, it would have, one, there's, there's sometimes on college campuses, they're in your social group. For me, it was in the same student government office, and had, had I been forced to report, um, there's no doubt that I don't think that many of the people in that office would have believed me, and so I would have been pushed out. You would have hurt me more than helped me. Um, but that being said, how you can help, what suggestions that I have to help a friend or a family member who shares a story, listen. It's not your, your uh, position to judge or to ask questions or to clarify. Um, it, just let them talk. Second, refer. So refer them to um, a counselor or there's even um, hotlines like the RAIN Sexual Assault Hotline, um, which I'm pretty sure is 1-800-866-HOPE. Um, I'm sure that <laughs> Nicole can look it up right now. Um, and uh, that was the first after my attempt um, that was the first resource I called and the first thing that they told me was you're okay, you're not alone, um, it's not your fault. Like the things I wanted to hear right after it, they were the ones to tell me. Um, so offer them actual professional resources and then whatever they decide to do to tell someone to not tell someone to report to not report, respect their decision. Because um, there's many survivors who experience it by family members, sexual violence by family members and you might be confused as to why they wouldn't do something about it and it's because they're within their family or within a social group or they just don't feel comfortable. So um, just respecting their decision but no, letting them know that you're there for them. I don't know if Shaw has anything to add. Well, I think that, you know, this is a situation, me personally, the way I've seen it because I have had friends that have gone through this sort of terrible violence and um, I think that people will seek the help they need when they're ready and the resources they need. That it's a very individual journey, and like you said, you know, sometimes the risk benefit. You know, it just depends. It's very individual. If, like you said, if it's within a family, there's other ramifications as to you know who tells who and so forth. So I think you have to be really ready to deal with the consequences of that, and that's a very individual situation. Yeah, that's not to say if someone wants to report to like tell them not to. Um, if someone decides to report, then you should help them in any way possible um, because it's already hard to report. It's going to be even harder going through the process, but let them decide. Cool. And All one right. thing I would just add really quick is mm -hmm. um, less is more with regard to questions because there's a lot of questions like where were your friends and what were you doing doing that that can feel to someone who just experienced an assault very blaming and shaming. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of questions you really need to ask. I mean, 
you know, I think people watch a lot of CSI and a lot, a lot, a lot of Law and Order, and they want a lot of detail. And I really think that um, folks should share what they want to share, how they want to share it. And to Savannah's point, if they want to report, encourage it. But if they don't, you know, know that people are on their own journey. Yeah. Awesome. So our next question um, is, have you all seen the new documentary film, The Hunting Ground? <laughs> if so, as survivors, did you agree with the main findings of the film? If not, I urge you to see it. Um, so for, for me, actually, uh, Kirby and mm -hmm. Amy, who are the directors and producers, had interviewed uh, myself as well as some other LA-based survivors for it, so I have seen it. Um, and I think that the findings where it concentrates, yes, on, on women experiencing sexual violence, um, sexual violence on friends, friends on friends, so knowing the person, acquaintance rape, um, how the Greek culture can um, create entitlement and make it so that it's easier for someone to be um, sort of... They basically talked about how um, fraternity men are, 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 have high likelinesses of being uh, perpetrating sexual violence. Not all, obviously, but they were talking about that. And then the last one is athlete culture as well and how that plays in to either um, hiding or trying to um, cover up sexual violence by athletes. And I do agree with a lot of it because um, many of the people who are portrayed in the, in the film um, or interviewed in the film are people that I know who are activists themselves and who've had a lot of personal, um, the best way I could say is tragedy because they decided to come forward and talk about their experiences. So for example, for the woman from FSU who um, Jameis Winston um, sexually assaulted, her case was butchered. Um, there was, there's no other way of putting it and um, it's something that does happen at many uh, colleges because funding through athletics it, and getting alumni um, interested through athletics is such a business that it can really hurt. So for those who've watched it, alumni who are watching this, I would say um, to obviously, I would say watch it because it's very eye-opening and they do a, very, do a very balanced job of talking about it, but also um, I hope that you can support initiatives by student activists and um, advocates working within the system like Nicole and um, our counseling center and um, our dean of students who work to try to provide more resources for student survivors. So maybe look to that film as sort of what's going wrong and maybe think about ways in which you can contribute as Alumni Affairs puts your time, your treasure, or your talent um, towards uh, improving our campus and other campuses as well. If you're alumni of other campuses, I would I would urge you to look into how potentially you could help those students as well. Shaw or Nicole? I have not seen the movie, but I do appreciate the fact that in general I'm seeing a lot more awareness around domestic violence when I turn on the television, there's a sporting event or game. I think there's just a lot more um, awareness in general of what's going on um, and that it's not okay. And I think if the I, I think the key is repetition. If we consistently repeat the message that violence against women is wrong, um, you know, on a regular basis, particularly on channels or event, around events that um, you know are male dominated, things that people watch often on a Sunday afternoon, I think it, it helps. It helps reinforce the message that it's not okay. Um, I have not seen the movie, but I definitely would like to see it. it seems like a really interesting film. Right. Um, me too. I'm seeing it next Monday. Um, so, um, but you know, I'm I'm aware of the stories. Um, certainly, they're happening across the country. Um, it's a little like um, some of the other socio political issues. Like a few get highlighted, but really, this is something that's been pervasive. Um, and um, as I said, violence against women is a worldwide epidemic and there are lots of cultures and communities that foster and endorse and sort of collude with it. Um, so um, I'm excited to see the content, mostly to figure out like what can we do as a, as a system, as a university community to, um, my focus, my job is really about prevention and education. 
So from that standpoint, I'm looking at it more to figure out um, what, what are ways to really do some pre good prevention work. Mm -hmm. um, that's my focus. Awesome. Um, and yeah, I agree with uh, both of you and then Shaw to the point where we're talking more about domestic violence and the NFL and um, mm -hmm. the PSAs by No More and all of that. I think that um, we're focusing on college campuses right now, but it's, this is not a campus uh, problem. This is a community and cultural problem that we have um, worldwide. Um, like you said, violence against women is is epidemic levels, and so we have to address it. There's a nonprofit called The Call to Men that talks about uh, violence against women, and it talks about the, the root of it being gender inequality. And I think that that's something we have to address if we're going to be addressing and and actually fixing all the underlying root cause of violence against women. But that was a tangent. Um, so our next question is, um, to add to the documentary questions, in your opinion, what are colleges and universities doing right, and what could be improved? Anyone want to jump on this question first? Well, I feel, oh, go ahead, Shaw. No, I was just going to say that I think there's a lot more resources now that are available. And again, going back to awareness, I think there is an increasing awareness compared to when mm -hmm. I was at UCLA, which is really great to see. Nicole can probably Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think one of the great things about the activism and some of the national spotlight on some high-profile cases is that um, there is an intense amount of attention and scrutiny about what's going on, what are the policies, what are we doing, is everybody on the same page, do we all have the same language? So I, what I think is happening right right now is that there are a lot of resources being poured into understanding mm -hmm. what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, how good are we listening to the students um, and hearing what could be done better. And um, in terms of response, I mean, I really do think um, the White House Task Force, Time Magazine, all of these high-profile um, all this high profile attention has really had a positive impact on my job because people are paying attention to what I'm doing. They want to know why, how I was trained and what I, you know, who, who's doing this work. And I think these are all really important, relevant questions. And I've been doing this work now um, for like, for, you know, maybe the last five years. And I think in the last two years, people are paying attention to like what are you presenting where are you presenting how often are you presenting what are you saying to people and how are you trained to say it I think these are questions that you know like it's sort of like me with my kids finally asking the teacher do you have a credential do you what do you how do you know what you're doing mm -hmm. so I think it's really really important that um, this attention is finally happening yeah it's a long way to go I will say that yeah, yeah. I think um, for what colleges and universities are doing right, we're talking about consent, we're talking about um, uh, alcohol as it relates to consent, Con alcohol is not consent, we're talking about bystander intervention and the ways in which we can change culture, and this is so amazing and this comes from additional resources, so that can be grant money from the federal government for new innovative ways to talk about consent. I know new student orientation, every new student that comes onto our campus, whether transfer or freshman, has to go through consent education, needs to know what their resources are. Like, these are, I mean, they've had this in the past, but they have, it's more robust now. Um, and we have better community um, resources, but I will say this, our campuses are getting a lot of these resources. Our campuses already um, are teaching our, the new students, but that's, that's not going to address the underlying issue society-wise and community-wise. I mean, many and most survivors on our campuses come onto our campuses as survivors. Um, they experience it before the age of 18. Um, think, talking about consent education and alcohol education when you're, when you're 18 years old coming into um, uh, college is kind of late. So while I absolutely love the fact that colleges and universities are going above and beyond um, what, is, what is mandated to them by the law, and that's amazing for students like myself who are on college campuses, what about students or non, what about individuals who aren't on college campuses, especially fourth year or four year college campuses, so community colleges, and what about those who don't go to college at all? How are we going to prevent sexual violence within that population? 
you shouldn't be able, like, you shouldn't to have to have um, the money to go to a college to understand what sexual violence is or to feel supported if you are a survivor. So for me, it, I, I love the national attention. It's over overdue. Um, but I also think that we're thinking um, for a small population right now. And while I love UCLA, why don't we talk about Los Angeles as a whole? Or why don't we talk about California as a whole? Or the, our country as a whole? So um, love what universities are doing. Now let's take what we're doing right at universities and let's put it into the communities. Um, and I think for you alumni, that would be reaching out to local partners wherever you're, you are, wherever, like a local domestic violence shelter or um, rape crisis center or nonprofit and seeing what they're doing and maybe trying to help. Um, it's just, I see so many students who wish that they had understood what consent was in high school or middle school um, when they first experienced it or when they first experienced inappropriate um, touching or inappropriate just language. And had they had it earlier, maybe, maybe there would be less sexual violence now. Or they would have had peers who knew how to support them. So I, I like the college question, and I love the fact that we're talking about it as alumni, but I also think that it's our responsibility as UCLA alumni and students to talk about our community as well. Cool. Um, so our next question is, I recently heard about bystander intervention. Could you share information on this topic? Do you want me to share? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, bystander intervention has been an approach around for a long time. Um, it's sort of based in um, a very famous case in the 70s, the um, Genovese case where a woman was being raped and murdered in a New York apartment and there were hundreds of people around and no one stopped to help and she died. Um, and really it also has to do with a lot of um, social norms theory that's in if you remember back to undergrad about um, psychology and sociology that um, people do um, what other people are doing. So if two people are in something, um, the research is really clear that um, if I'm hurting Savannah and there's just the three of us, a shawl is likely to intervene. If there's 30 of us, there's less likely that anyone's going to intervene. If there's 300 of us, it's almost likely that no one's going to intervene. So it's a sort of counterintuitive understanding that the more bystanders, there's more diffusion of responsibility. So the issue with sexual violence, what I love about where we are in the movement is we're moving away from, let's focus on, on um, interventions with the victim, making sure that they have mace and keep their doors locked and all of this, which sort of puts the responsibility on the victim. Mm -hmm. We're not focused on the perpetrator because we really can't find them, and they probably aren't going to deter their behavior anyway. We're sparking, focusing on this group of folks in the middle who probably are witnessing a lot of things going on and not intervening. So bystander intervention is really this approach that's focused on the 95% of individuals in the middle who, for whatever reason, because of social norms, will not intervene. So in situations where you're at a party and you see something happen, but you don't want to be the one to call somebody out. And we focus on really um, helping people to understand that freshmen think that every UCLA student eat, drinks eight drinks at one time, when really most UCLA students drink less than four. Yeah. So the social norm is that a freshman will drink seven, thinking they're trying to keep up with the eight, rather than the real actual number, which is four. So what we, the way that relates to sexual violence is that we know that most men don't have these thoughts about women, would not do a lot of these things to women that are being done in terms of um, violating their consent or using alcohol as a date rape drug. But many men think that other men are doing it, so trying to correct some of those social norms, but also teaching folks how to intervene and realizing, helping folks to realize that um, that they need to assume responsibility because the likelihood anyone else will is very low. And we have a lot of data on it and um, we're trying to use it to encourage folks to get involved. And um, much like before 9-11, people saw a backpack on the street, they would leave it alone. Now you see so many folks, there's a backpack on the street, people see something, they do something. They call somebody. So much like that same culture shift, we have to have a culture shift around sexual violence. You see something wrong, you do something. Yeah. Don't leave it alone. 
So that's what sex, that's what bystander intervention is. That's what we're trying, how we're trying to use it with, um, with sexual violence prevention. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's more add. Oh no, um, just a, one addition for for um, seven thousand solidarity, the campus group. When we're reaching out to uh, doing bystander intervention and teaching it to people, um, one of the things we do is like you can distract. So, for example, we had talked with um, a fraternity pledge who later on used it, and what he did was he told like he saw a situation where um, it looked it looked unsettling, and so he went up to um, his older fraternity brother went up to him and said, "Hey, man, your car's gonna get towed." And it was just a way to get him to leave the situation, to stop what he was doing to this person. And it could be as simple as that. But, I mean, Nicole put it in a much more academic sense, and uh, it's something that can hopefully lead to a culture shift. We got yeah. a lot more questions. Um, cool. Mm -hmm. So let's go with someone who hasn't had their question answered. Um, so Kristen, does seeing something new in the news trigger PTSD-like response in survivors? Is there a difference for those who have sought help in the past and have resiliency or those who haven't? So I, I wonder if this is another Nicole for <laughs> Nicole, yeah. Um, well, I know the data is pretty clear that um, people have better outcomes when they um, for the most part, when they seek help, and when they the earlier that they seek help, the better their outcomes mm -hmm. are. And the more that people believe them, the first responder, whoever it is, a friend, um, a partner, um, their teacher, the more that they're believed and validated, the better their outcomes are. And the more that people are blamed, the 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 worse their outcomes are. So some of it has to do with the support that they got when they just when they disclosed. That really creates a lot of resilience. Um, and the the more people get help, the um, the better the outcomes are more generally. Um, I will say with regard to seeing something on the news and people getting re-triggered, um, I don't really know the data, but I do know from personal anecdotes just working with folks who have histories of trauma, you know, because of the way PTSD works, and that's post-traumatic stress disorder, um, we're already so heightened and so aware of something that's going, when you're on alert, you're concerned that something bad is going to happen to you, it's really easy to get triggered. And so it may not even just be something on TV. It could be a sound, a familiar smell. Lots of things can trigger this um, eruption of anxiety, which is what PTSD, it can be like a sense of um, freezing and sort of shutting down or a sense of anxiety and heightening up. But there are lots of things in our environments that can trigger it, including TV, but loud, loud sounds. Um, you know, a car that looked the same as maybe the perpetrator, that was the same one that the perpetrator drove. You know, I've had clients who, again, were um, triggered by sounds or smells or words even. So I think the PTSD reaction is pretty um, individual as I've seen it as a clinician, but certainly things can trigger someone. Um, and so that's why it's really, really important to get help so that you understand what's happening in your body and in your mind and that you don't feel alone with it, that you can be validated, that it can make sense to you, then you can kind of figure out how, what is this reaction that I'm having and really not be, because a lot of times people have a feeling and then they have a feeling, they have a feeling. So they're anxious and then they're scared that they're anxious. Mm -hmm. So just with the help of understanding the process will help a person get better. I hope that makes That's sense. That's right. And I, I think like for me personally, I just try to avoid scenarios that may trigger yeah, a bad yeah, memory. Yeah, totally. Um, when, I see, when I anticipate something that isn't going to be favorable for me coming my way, I just close my eyes and open them. And I'm okay because I didn't witness whatever it may be that may be that trigger, like the sound or whatever it may be. For me, it was a visual moment. So mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. It, it, you know, it's there, but you learn to deal with it. And I will say, I just want to, I can't even stress enough, there's so much we know about PTSD and treatment of anxiety and the treatment of depression. I really want to just encourage folks, if they are struggling, to try to seek help because if you understand it, there's a lot we can do to help folks these days. 
Yeah, I second Nicole. Um, I I let my sort of depression and feelings after my sexual assault spiral into such a dark place, and I and I I'm already inclined um, and and diagnosed with clinical depression, so. Um, letting it get to that place and not learning how to manage it with a counselor is is a really scary um, prospect, a really scary place to be. Um, and then in terms of, of feeling triggered, it could just be a phrase that that person right. said. Um, I recommend if you any of you have time to look into um, a website called Project Unbreakable and it's um, a photo series with um, survivors who have um, a piece of paper in front of them and or a, a poster and it's quotes that their friends or um, their perpetrator had said and there there um, there are many who for example uh, blurred lines I know that that was a huge contentious uh, uh, song but there were many survivors who felt triggered by it because many of the same things that their perpetrators had said was the lyrics of that song so it could be anything as just like this catchy song to um, a, a certain like like um, uh, uh, Nicole had said a certain smell. For for some um, that I know, if they were intoxicated while it happened, it's certain alcohol. They will never drink again because it just it brings them back into a place where they they couldn't control themselves, um, and and something that happened out of their control. So um, there are things that that happen, but like Nicole also said, if you go to counseling, it's a lot easier to to mitigate those um, reactions. Cool. Um, all right, next question. There's so many good questions. Um, let's see. Let's go with this one. How can I be an advocate or an ally against this issue? Are there some good organizations to volunteer with or groups to join? <laughs> well, thank you for the question, Diversity Programs. Um, <laughs> um, so as a survivor and survivor activist, um, personally in, in answering this question, um, I'm going to talk about it from an activist point of view and, and, and from what students are doing and, and survivor activists need. Um, what we really need is just people who have influence to, to help us with asking for um, legislation change and cultural change. Um, the way in which you can be an advocate or an ally is to give your talent, your treasure, or your time. And if the only thing that you can give is even just your influence, you know a local legislator, or you heard about um, a local law that's going, or a state law that's going to be coming up, like there's a state law, SB 695, for those that live in California, which is going to have... Um, uh, consent education in high schools, which is amazing for, for many survivors because hopefully then we can actually have support from our peers if we were to talk about sexual violence or it could prevent sexual violence before it happens. And so um, if you can, it would just be anything from talking to your legislator to um, working with a nonprofit. Um, there are really great national organizations, but I'm going to let Nicole talk about those, or local organizations or if you're an alumni there's a lot that can be done on our own campus and while I think that talking about college campuses might be a little narrow I think that we could be the model for the community so that's what I have to say about that um, Nicole or Shaw? Shaw did you want to say? You know I think I think you would be probably the best person for okay. this yeah. Um, well, for sure. There's lots of things, to, ways to get involved, big and small. Um, certainly funding. So at UCLA as an alum, um, there are student affairs giving funds that you can call up the Vice Chancellor Student Affairs Office and say, how can I give to the sexual violence prevention programs on campus or Title IX on campus? Um, certainly, um, it's hard to volunteer specifically with our counseling center because we we have um, obligations to protect student privacy. So most students and um, alum cannot volunteer um, in our office, but there are lots of community organizations, Peace Over Violence, um, the Sojourn um, Center for Women, the Genesee Center for Battered Women is another one locally in LA. Um, I know that they're going to put online a list of community resources and campus resources. So if there are, there, it's as easy as 
if you see someone in the store being harassed, or they're, some, they're getting their skirt pulled on or their bra strap snapped, in, intervening. That's mm -hmm. probably one of the easiest ways to get involved, all the way to more major things like supporting some of the nonprofit work, some of the battered women's shelters, really giving back to UCLA and student affairs to really continue the work that we're doing. So there are lots of big and small ways to get involved. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and like Nicole had said, there there will be a list of local nonprofits um, as well as ways you can give back to UCLA on this issue. Um, let's go to a little bit more of a contentious topic. What are your thoughts on the UVA Rolling Stone article um, and the impact it could have on resources, support, and narrative? Mm -hmm. Who wants to start with that one? Okay, I guess I can. Um, <laughs> so personally, the 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 way in which the Rolling Rolling Stone, um, specifically the author, um, uh, decided to throw the survivor Jackie under the bus is something that, as a student survivor activist, it's scary to see. Um, personally, the author actually reached out to a network of sexual assault survivors, myself included, asking for our stories. So she shopped around for the most horrific one that she could possibly find, um, which is also really not great reporting, um, but typical, I suppose. Um, it, When you report on things like this, um, their trauma, and I'm going to let Nicole maybe talk a little bit about it, but trauma can affect memory. And so while maybe some small details of her story might not be correct, that doesn't mean that the overall, um, her experience of receiving sexual violence at a UVA fraternity is false. Um, now what that impact can do on resources, support, and the narrative, the, the, the mainstream narrative around sexual violence, by nitpicking and by saying that because some tiny details of her assault were incorrect that her entire narrative is wrong and therefore Rolling Stone um, Rolling Stone did a terrible job and then Rolling Stone saying that it was a survivor's fault for lying um, and therefore it was false and, there, and the entire story is false and it was a false report. It basically buys into the narrative that most sexual assaults are false reports or, or are women just looking for attention or looking for um, uh, some sort of media power and that's really dangerous because Many survivors feel already when you talk about sexual violence that either it's their fault or no one's going to believe us. And if, no, if you feel from the onset that no one's going to believe you, you're not going to go get resources. And if you're not going to go get resources, it's going to happen what we were talking about earlier, which is people are going to have um, longer uh, consequences on their mental health and their physical health. So for me, when I see this, it basically buys into that narrative and makes it harder for activists to, to try to bring positive change. And it, and it could potentially take away resources from, from um, so funding um, or, or research away from institutions that need it. So that's my take. It, it's, it, when, I, when I saw that Rolling Stone article and the backlash that came from it, it was terrifying to see because that could have been my narrative. I mean, there's some details I don't remember, and just because I don't remember them or I remember slight changes doesn't mean that I'm lying. That's true. Now, I agree with that. I think it's hard when you're in it to remember every detail. I remember lying in a hospital bed, you know, on IV drugs and just trying to stay awake and aware, and the police were in there, and I'm trying to pick the guy, you know, I'm going through these albums, and I'm... I mean, I could remember who he was, but there was weapons involved and noise and blood and just the experience was so harrowing, it's hard to remember every detail, nor does your mind want to remember every detail. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of battling that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, if I dig deep, I can, I can get there, but it's hard. I mean, who wants to go back and really dig? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it is hard to to get into the details of every single moment of what's happening when it's happening because it feels so long but it's really a short amount of time often times. That's right. So. I mean I would just echo what everybody said. I mean first of all um, kind of nitpicking um, someone's story is really 
a challenge, but I think it goes back to the bigger, broader issues of we see this time and time and time again when victims come forward in the media. There have been several high-profile athletes and several high-profile um, superstars that have been accused of sexual violence and the attack is always these women have some agenda, there's some, you know, there's something. Mm -hmm. And I really think that it really contributes to this um, narrative around um, she lied, this, um, these, these rape myths that really are perpetuated when, um, even in the face of evidence, you know, um, it's like hidden in plain sight kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I really think it distracts us from the real issue of look at these this culture, whether it's university culture, policy, communities that have been allowed to, you know, um, conduct themselves in certain ways, rather than looking at, wow, is this a potential problem? We get focused on just picking apart one narrative. And so I, um, I, I just, the UVA article feels like one of a zillion um, stories where someone is like, well, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. And the number of like um, factors, social factors that then make it less likely, whether you're transgender or LGBT or um, a woman of color or whatever, less and less believable. Like it's not possible that this could happen. And when really the data is so clear yeah. that the more vulnerable community you're from, the more likely it is to happen. So to me, it's just one more example of the same old story that mostly has to do with um, social justice and rape culture and climate. Yeah, thank you um, for your answers. And this will be our last question before we close out. Um, if you had the opportunity to meet with the president to discuss this topic of a culture of violence against women, what would you say? Um, oh, let who wants to start? Well, that's a big question. I mean, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. So I definitely would applaud his efforts in moving in that direction. You know, just more awareness, more resources being pooled. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just starting, like you said, at a younger age, um, mm -hmm. giving people permission to to speak about this openly. And I I think that I would applaud that effort. I know we have a long way to go. Um, I can definitely speak to that as well. However, I think we are um, definitely on a positive tra trajectory. So, feel good about that. Awesome. Cole, you want to go next? Um, yeah, that's a hard question. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> so I would just say that my hope would be moving toward, by the time Sasha and Malia go to college, like a zero tolerance around a lot of these shenanigans and um, getting to a place where folks, that we start to, right now we're kind of like, the prevention is happening in the sense that more people are coming forward and I really would like to move to, it's probably going to take another decade or two, you know, to get to a place where this is really starting, we're starting to curb the behavior actually. Mm -hmm. And so I really would like to talk about um, ways that, like, he has daughters that, you know, what can we do sort of to move this towards a zero tolerance around um, this kind of violence? That would be my conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would say to the president, um, put your money where your mouth is and also um, put emphasis on education. So I know that that might be, I, I love his um, White House task force on this issue. I think that It's On Us is a great program to bring awareness, um, but I think that you have to, if you want to have longevity with creating this social change, you have to put resources toward victim services um, nationwide. And then secondly, you have to educate students on consent education and healthy relationships starting in elementary, middle school, and high school. And that could be done through just talking about respect. You don't have to talk about sex, and I know that's a huge topic where um, some parents don't want schools to talk about um, sex, but right now either students are coming to our, our universities only understanding biological sex or abstinence only. And there's no talk about what is a healthy relationship, what is respect, um, what are the signs of an abusive relationship, and um, what is consent in general. And if we can talk about these things, we can try to curve 
um, violence against women, specifically through sexual violence and domestic violence. So um, I would ask for those, and I think that we also need to just do more education in general on gender equality. Um, and that's for all genders, but specifically talking about um, how we still have a long way to go for women's equality. Um, not just legal equality, but social equality. So that would be my ask. I would probably tear it so that it's a little bit more realistic. <laughs> but I would, I would ask first and foremost for education um, and then for resources. And hopefully then if he's really feeling like he wants to give a lot of stuff, <laughs> gender equality. <laughs> but that's, that's what I would do. Um, but I think we're out of time now, so thank you to the panelists and the attendees who are watching this. Um, we really appreciate all your questions, and we happen to answer all the questions that were submitted, but if you have any um, that you would like to give that perhaps you want to just tell your story or you feel like um, you had something that you wanted to ask but didn't want to do it publicly, you can email diversity at alumni. Wait, hold on, I got it. Oh, oh, oh we'll, we'll send it to you. Um, I had it in front of me before. Um, and just so that you know, the, um, the webinar is available at UCLA Alumni um, YouTube channel. So you can just look up UCLA Alumni um, on YouTube. There will be a follow-up email for those who participated. They will have the resources that were shared, um, specifically those from our um, Counseling and Psychological Services uh, Campus Assault Resources and Education um, component. And uh, you'll also have an email address that I butchered <laughs> that you can send your questions to. And then lastly, um, check out the rest of the Women's Her Story Month events at alumni.ucla.edu slash diversity. Um, the next one will include March Madness, Women in Sports panel on um, the 26th, and a screening of the Hunting Grounds on the 30th. Um, that will be at James West Alumni Center, and it's next Monday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.